welcome everyone to this joint uh, collaborative event, uh, University of North Texas and Data Ethics for All. And um, we have a fabulous event planned for you today. Uh, this is part of our Pet for Youth talk series and we'll introduce the speakers in a bit. Um, we have Mary S. Lynn, who is a curator of Smithsonian. And then we have Shobna Chalia, who is the Associate Dean of Research at University of North Texas. And we are going to create new pathways and talk about new career STEM pathways with, that are non-linear and that are available for our youth today. Uh, and how linguistics connects with artificial intelligence uh, and beyond. So this is a very exciting talk, very near and dear to my heart, um, especially because that's one of the focus of Data Ethics for All's initiative. Data Ethics for All made a pledge to help 5 million, uh, 5 million economically disadvantaged students in the next five years, uh, providing them with leadership opportunities, STEM and mentoring opportunities, career guidance, career technical education, and even essay reviewing, um, all at no cost. And our Pet for Youth series is um, designed to help our youth explore that. And so I'm very excited to partner with the University of North Texas uh, and the Department of Information Science on this very important uh, journey. A little bit about data ethics for all. Hi, hi everyone. I am Shilpi Agarwal, founder of Data Ethics for All. Um, today, less than uh, a little over a year and a half ago, we started Data Ethics for All. And today we are a community of 980 members to date. Um, this is an old slide. We are close to a thousand members now, uh, which is really, really exciting. Today, I'm going to introduce some of our exclusive events that are youth focused. Um, and some of them are like we had a panel discussion on how social stigmas instigate racial justice, injustice in society. And it was a panel discussion between adults and, and teenagers. And um, it was part of our ethics for next gen AI summit that we did last year. We have a youth leadership council for AI um, that invites um, youth leaders from middle and high schools to start clubs and chapters at their uh, local schools and even undergrad students um, and then volunteer with us as leaders. And one of the key things about our organization is that we are certified to provide the Presidential Volunteer Service Award, the PVSA Award, which is the highest award of community service that one can get um, in the United States. Um, there is some eligibility criteria. And if you are interested in learning more about that, please, please stick around after the event. And we are happy to help you with that. We have many, many volunteering opportunities as well as leadership opportunities for youth as well as adults. We have um, our actually youth, AI Youth Council has been instrumental in creating three courses, introductory courses for artificial intelligence, data, and ethics. And here in this slide is the first of that course. It's called Introduction to Data and AI. And I'm really proud because sometimes, you know, we adults come up with these courses. I've been an instructor at Stanford myself. So I understand, you know, how we design these courses. But sometimes, for a, for a young middle or high schooler to understand these concepts, it's tough. And so these courses have been designed by their peers. And so I'm really excited about that because we hope that the material covered in this um, course and students can even earn certification of completion, which they can show on their um, college applications. So it, it's really a fantastic opportunity all at no cost um, for our youth. And we have the free STEM tutoring club, uh, which has over, we have partnered with and registered tutors from over 50 schools across the nation now. And so that again is fantastic to provide. We are able to provide free STEM tutoring in physics, chemistry, biology, um, AP courses, mathematics, um, AP Com Com Sci, 
as well as essay reviews, like I mentioned earlier. And these are some of the other fantastic things that we are doing besides the Pet for You talk series. We also have workshops. Um, we did. We have done two workshops previously. One was introduction to Java, and the other one was introduction to graphic design. And so we are really like. And these again were um, student-led uh, projects and workshops, and they were actually hands-on, where students got um, an opportunity to go along and work along with this uh, workshop. Our Data Ethics Institute hosts over 13 courses to date uh, and more are being added every day. We have town hall meetings for inviting all our members and we have had, I think, five uh, town hall meetings so far um, with you know various topics that are near and dear to current um, you know, generation as well as to share wisdom across generations on uh, the effect of social media and disinformation as well as how social media is polarizing, uh, creating polarization, um, how students uh, and adults are now constantly looking for external validation on social media platforms instead of you know, believing in themselves and how all of these are affecting and changing our behavior on a day-to-day -day basis. We even watched the social dilemma as a, as a group, as a, uh, what's it called, Netflix party. Um, so yeah, I mean, we are all about educating youth on the ethical use of data science. And without further ado, I know you want to hear more from our speakers today. And we have two fabulous speakers here. Um, so I'm going to introduce Mary Lynn, who is the curator of Smithsonian. Um, and she will be presenting a talk on her journey from being a linguistic at a Smithsonian. So Mary S. Lynn is a linguist, curator of language and cultural vitality at the Smithsonian Center for Folk Life and Cultural Heritage. Her primary research is an effective grassroots strategies in language reclamation and cultural sustainability, especially in small and minoritized language communities. Her work focuses on native North America, especially Oklahoma, Europe, and Tibetan areas of China. She is the director of the Language Vitality Initiative that focuses on collaborative language research networking, training communities in language and cultural documentation, and evaluating impact of grassroots language revitalization efforts. Before joining the Smithsonian in 2014, she co-started the Oklahoma Native American Youth Language Fair and the Oklahoma Breath of Life as founding curator of Native American languages at the Sam Noble Museum. Mary received her PhD at the University of Kansas with the descriptive grammar of the Yuchi language in 2001. Please welcome Mary Lynn. Mary, welcome. There we go. I was having trouble unmuting. Hello, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, well, that pretty much was my talk <laughs> because this is about my life as a linguist, but I'm just joking. Um, thank you very much for inviting me here today, and um, I hope we'll have fun with this. Um, I, I think that it's a, a mixture of um, how I became a linguist and really what is a linguist. Um, and um, what we do, you know, what linguists do in the world. So um, it, this kind of started because I was talking with some friends and we were talking about the different jobs that I've had and it kind of touched on many of the major areas that, of linguists, that linguists do. So we thought this might be a good way to approach the topic. Um, so here we go, my life as a linguist. But before we do that, we're gonna, I'm gonna give you a quiz. <laughs> A quick quiz on here. Um, so the first one is, um, how many languages do you think are spoken in the world today? Do you think there's about 500, about 2,000, about 7,000, or over 13,000? 
<laughs> are they are there are we supposed to put our answers in comments um you can do that that might be faster than us trying to um to go back and forth and speak but if if anybody wants to put 7k 13d let people d over 13 c yeah so most of you, it's it's about between the C and D, but it's actually around 7,000. It fluctuates, it goes in and out, uh, that's for sure. Um, but um, yeah, there's about, here, I need to do it this way. There's about, um, six, yeah, about seven, a little over 7,000. But the interesting thing about this number is only about 23 of the languages are spoken by over half of the world's population. So it's very top heavy on a few really major languages. At least 40% of the languages in the world are endangered. And this means that um, there's not younger generations learning the language naturally in the home. Um, many of that 40% have fewer than a thousand speakers in them. So the world really is right now um, in a crisis on one hand, I would also argue that we're um, also in a revolution of language revitalization. And I work on the end of language revitalization. How do people change the shift from majority languages and help keep their languages alive? Let's look a little bit closer to home if your home is the United States. Um, so how many um, Native American languages were spoken in North America? at the time of European arrival, so around 1492, how many languages? Do you think there was about 50, about 150, about 300, or more than 500? You can put them in um, A, about 50, D. I see, I'm hearing a D, C, 150, D, a lot of Ds. Okay, um, if, you, if you had D in mind, you're correct. And that's just North, that is just North America at where the current US-Mexican border is. So it does not include uh, Mexico at all. There were um, more than 500 languages, we're not quite sure exactly how many, and over probably about 56 language families. To compare that with Europe, there's three major language families in Europe. Um, so, and, and 58 or 56 around there um, in, in the United States. So the U.S. was, uh, or in Canada, was very, very diverse. The most language diversity today is in Asia. Um, so, but today in North America, uh, there's about 165 languages that are still spoken. Um, only eight are spoken by as many as 10,000 people and most have fewer than 75 um, speakers. And some of these are languages that are considered silent, meaning that there is no longer any first language fluent speakers. Um, however, there are younger people and younger generations learning the languages from archival materials and from developing the language amongst themselves as they relearn the language. So. So what is linguistics? What does a language curator do, especially a language curator that me that doesn't have a collection? <laughs> we'll talk about this. But to see where I've, before, where I've come from to where I'm going, I think it's good to talk about what the Smithsonian is, since that's the target of this in many ways. Um, where I work now is um, in the Center for Folk Life and Cultural Heritage. Um, the Smithsonian Institution is the world's largest complex of museums, educational areas, and research um, um, centers. We have 19 museums, uh, gardens, and the National Zoo. Uh, most of them are here in this picture. You can see it's on, you can kind of see the capital way in the top right, um, but it's on the National Mall. Most of the museums are there, not all of them are. Um, so there's also eight research centers, including one in Panama, one in the Arctic, and uh, the observation uh, observatory in Hawaii. 
Um, there are three cultural centers, including the Center for Folk Life and Cultural Heritage, where I work. And there's also the Cultural Rescue Initiative, which goes into places like Haiti, um, Iraq, and Syria um, to keep areas from being bombed and, or cultural heritage from being bombed and looted and trying to salvage what's left after um, terrorist attacks in, of cultural heritage items. So how did I get there? I grew up in Wichita, Kansas, <laughs> a very monolithic part or monolingual part of the country. I didn't grow up hearing other languages. Um, I certainly didn't grow up hearing Native American languages. Um, I, I had a father who spoke some German and some Spanish and was very attuned to languages. But I also have um, a very good French teacher when I was in high school. And I was fortunate enough to have an exchange program, a summer exchange program that I went to. I was the first member of my family to leave the United States um, that was not going to war. <laughs> Um, it scared my family, <laughs> but I came back, of course, as most people do on, on, a, on a program like that, very changed. Um, I no longer, I saw the world as very lo much larger. I no longer saw people who behaved differently than my family or the, my neighbors as being very odd, but as something very interesting and something that I wanted to learn about. When I graduated from high school, I didn't know what I wanted to do. When I graduated from college, I didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, a lot of people do have something in mind. I was not one of those fortunate ones. I thought I might be a cellist, thought I might be a photographer. My degree was in American studies. Um, I didn't really, I, I, I have worked at a museum in high school um, and in college um, doing kind of just grunt work here and there. Um, but I didn't really know what I wanted to do. So I moved to Lawrence, Kansas, because that was, you know, where hippies lived. <laughs> And, um, and I started teaching English as a second language after a while, and I really loved it. Um, I loved working with students. Um, I loved hearing about where they lived and their cultures and seeing how things were different. I loved teaching, and I really got interested in my own language. I liked being able to answer questions about how my language worked. So this is where we get to the first thing of, um, of what a linguist does. A lot of people work in first and second language acquisition, where the main questions are, how do children acquire language? And we assume that adults will learn uh, quite a bit like how children. And the other questions are, how do adults learn more languages? Um, what does the multilingual or the bilingual brain look like? Um, and what are the more, most eff effective teaching methods for teaching different languages? Um, I was very interested in those. Um, I, had a, I had a teacher, um, in, I, so I started getting my master's degree in second language acquisition. And I had a, gradu a graduate advisor who asked me to go down to Oklahoma with him one summer um, to help teach some uh, mainly Indian women, so Native American women. Um, there were some men there, but not very many. Um, how to teach their languages because they were wanting to teach their languages because they were endangered. Um, and so I agreed to go down and help them. And I'm not in this picture because I'm behind the camera, but this is after three years, there's a Kickapoo uh, woman, woman and, a, and, a, and a white teacher that worked with her. There's um, some Muscogee Creek teachers and a Cherokee, uh, two Cherokee teachers in this picture. Um, and they're holding up some of the teaching materials that they developed for their languages. But it was really hard to develop teaching materials when most of them were speakers, but they didn't really know how their languages worked because you're a speaker doesn't necessarily mean you understand how it works. And for all of these languages, there were no uh, published grammars. There were no published dictionaries. Um, there was no written literature to draw on. And um, except for, uh, well, the Cherokee and the Muscogee, there were, there were writing systems, there were orthographies, but for other languages, there weren't. Kickapoo, there wasn't as well. So what do you do? And the, most of the languages in the world are in this position of those endangered languages that we we're talking about. Most of them don't have language description. So you have to start with 
figuring out how your language works. And this is what's called descriptive linguistics, documentary and descriptive linguistics. This next picture is of a Cameroonian PhD student working on a language in Cameroon. Um, work, um, so listening and describing the language. Uh, this is a picture of um, a, a student that is trained through one of the programs that I do at the Smithsonian. And um, he is, uh, he recorded uh, the elder man that's in the photograph uh, doing some cultural uh, making hammering tin. <laughs> and, uh, and they uh, are going back over this um, as a family and collecting more words about what he's doing and talking about it. And, and so this is called a re-elicitation um, session. So language documentation and description is one of my main areas. It's what I got my PhD in. Um, and the questions that people ask in this is really, um, well, how does a language work, this particular language work? How does, the, um, how does the sound system work? How do we put words together, the morphology, or into a word? Um, morphology, how do we put words together in a sentence, the syntax of the language? Um, how do we go beyond? How do we put these sentences together for larger units of meaning so that we're able to tell stories, that we're able to give compliments, um, tease each other, and everything that we do um, every day with language? Um, beyond that, we want to look at um, what are the best ways to document? So what are the new technologies to document and help us describe how dictionary programs, um, these types of efforts as well are part of those questions now. All of us actually can be documentary um, and descriptive linguistics uh, linguists. So I want to have some fun and uh, show you how we do this um, and do a little bit of Yuchi for you, <laughs> okay? Um, the, the, uh, it's hard to see because these aren't really um, lined up really well, but here's a couple Yuchi sentences and I'll read them for you. Uh, di fafa, I walk. Ne fafa, you walk. And se fafa, she walks. So if we look at those three sentences, how would you be able, can you tell me what the Yuchi word for walk is? You can type it in. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Right. So fa fa is the same in all three of those sentences and walk is the same in all of those sentences in English. So we can say that fa fa is the, um, the stem for the word to walk. So, um, and you can now peel off and you can say the word for I is D, right? The word for ne is you and say is she. We could even go further and say that you could give a little bit of description and say that um, in order to create a UT sentence, you need to put your pronoun and stick it to the front of the stem of your verb and you get a UT sentence. So, so you're writing a grammar as you go along. <laughs> you didn't know you could do that, did you? <laughs> okay, I'm gonna make it a little harder now. Uh, you are familiar, familiar with di fa fa, which means I walk. Um, what about di fa fa ne? I always walk. Di fa fa je. I walked. What's happening here? What? What's happening? <laughs> what's that ne on the end? What does it mean? It's called the habitual. It means you always do something. In English, we have to translate it as always. And the de uh, fa gen, that gen, the suffix on the end, is the past tense marker, right? So now you can describe a little bit more about how Yuchi works and you can say, um, attach on the end as a suffix, your tense and aspect, how th when and how things occur. It, um, see, you're writing a Yuchi grammar. <laughs> I'm gonna do one more, maybe two. I can't remember how many I put in here. I got excited. <laughs> okay, oh, here's this, is, well, this one's fun. Di fa fa, I walk. Di fa, I stand. Di pa, I hit. 
de papa i hammer <laughs> Anybody want to take a stab at what's going on here? I guess here maybe you could have somebody raise their hand and talk. I don't know. Can we do that? Yes, we can do that. It's not fair for Shobana to raise her hand. <laughs> <laughs> I can't see. So uh, uh, maybe here. I can see maybe here. Somebody raising. Oh, Miss Samantha. Um, hi, hi there, I'm Mary. I, I would I'd, I'd suggest that, that you're changing the suffix for the verb, right? So you're using the pronoun I, which is de, right? Mm -hmm. And then you're changing the suffix for the verb uh, uh -huh. in the present tense, if, if, I'm, if I'm right. Yeah, <laughs> so pa right. So you hammer. Yeah. yeah, so you change the front of it and you say who's doing the action, and you yeah. change the back of it and you change when the action occurred or how it occurred. So on this one, the de fa versus fa fa, we're changing the, the stem, we're changing the inside of it, and we're duplicating it. Fa to walk, or you know, to, to stand. And then in Yuchi, to walk is to like, and then stand again, walk, and then stand again, walk, and then stand again. It's a repetitive action, and they do it by repeating. Fa. I give you fa fa at first to kind of throw you off, but and you can see it really clearly in the second one because walking and standing is a little odd in English to think of it that way. But to hit something once versus to hit it multiple times to hammer, it's a repetitive action and you just repeat the stem. Kind of cool. It doesn't work like English that way, right? Okay, so. Um, Okay, now, now I, this is, I remember I did this one to you. So let's say fa fa is she walks. We'd had that one before. And then I'm throwing out a different one. Oh, fa fa. She, an elder, walks. So that's different than English too. We don't have two forms of she. We have just one. And this is where language and culture collide. In Yuchi, that O is what's called an honorific. Japanese does this, um, uh, uh, Vietnamese does this, a lot of languages do this. It's showing respect for somebody. And so to show respect, yes, it's, like, it's a formal address. It's like formal versus informal. Um, and you use it towards your grandmothers, your aunties, anybody who's older. I, I, I'm looking forward to the day when I can be referred to. I can never be referred to as an O, as an o in Yuchi, but, but uh, that's another story. That Yuchi also has a marker for non-Yuchis. Uh, way, I'm a way, you all are ways. So if I'm gonna walk, if somebody would talk about me, we'd say way fa fa, she walks, she's a non-Yuchi. So this shows you where language and culture kind of intersect. You can still say she, grammatical, but we showing that that in Yuchi culture, you need to show respect for somebody who is older than you are. And we also note that there's people who aren't like us. <laughs> Those are the non Yuchis, <laughs> okay? So um, it's just a little bit of Yuchi for you today to show you how these things, how la language documentation and description works. It's very close. You can see at the end that we're really getting close to what's called linguistic anthropology and sociolinguistics. Um, there's, there are different fields, although in Europe, sociolinguistics and linguistic anthropology are a little closer meshed than they are in the United States. But you ask questions like, um, you know, how do people use their language, where they use it, how it changes by where they're, where they're talking or who they're talking to. How does language change? Um, how do we get dialects, right? Uh, do men and women speak differently? And these kinds of questions. These are important questions when we're talking about revitalizing a language because it also has to do with how people feel about their languages, whether they feel they can use them publicly or not. So a lot of these questions I was grappling with for many, many years. And my first job when I graduated with my PhD was actually at the University of Pittsburgh, a very wonderful university where I was hired to teach about Native American languages and to do theoretical work as well. So language description is 
theoretical, but there's another level where we, instead of talking about how one language works, when we start comparing all languages and see how human language works. And these questions um, are really close to language in the brain, language and cognition. These are very integral questions to what it means to all of us to be human because we have this form in our brain. Um, so I started teaching like a good, a good person in linguists usually do. We get jobs in teaching and I love teaching. Um, and I um, had graduate students. I also really loved having graduate students <laughs> um, and undergraduate students as well. Um, and I still continue to teach um, like I did in Oklahoma with language teachers teaching linguistics and language teaching and language revitalization in what's called the Institute on Collaborative Language Research that was really training young people to be linguists around the world, um, in, in the United States and around the world. Um, these are community members and non-community members alike. It's also really, this institute really pushes a lot of the um, ways to, um, to look at language data um, in a collaborative form with the people, with the community members. So it's really changing a lots of areas of linguistics. Um, but I really wanted to be back in Oklahoma where I was, um, was working with people, uh, with community members all the time. And I um, got a position that was in the anthropology department. So I was no longer expected to do syntactic theory and morphological theory. I was expected to do the linguistic anthropology part of, of description. Um, and um, I was also made curator of the uh, Native American Languages Collection at the Sam Noble Oklahoma Museum of Natural History. So this is what people think that um, uh, archivists do, <laughs> language archivists do. Um, that's why I kind of have a funny look on my face is because I'm kind of laughing. There is language um, in, there is, um, you know, our, you know, written language stuff in there. <laughs> um, but that's not really what a language archivist does, especially a language archivist that works with endangered or minoritized languages. One of the things that we really do is help make these materials discoverable. So with metadata and um, accessible digitizing, but also understanding how to use the materials to not just academic researchers, of course, but to the community members that where these materials came from. We talked about at the beginning about how many languages are silent and one of the ways they've, they've breathed life back into their sleeping languages is through what are called the breath of life approach where people go, are, go into the archives find the materials and learn how to use them and use them to revitalize their languages. We did the, I did this on an o uh, Oklahoma level. Um, this, this approach was actually started in California and I've done it on the national level as well. And these are some Miamia, Miami tribe, Miamia um, researchers um, in the National Anthropological Archives. We also don't, um, don't really separate language from culture. Um, we really, uh, have people go into the the collections, the material culture collections as well, because that's, you know, it, it makes people remember things. It's why they want to be learning the language is to oftentimes use um, or renew older types of, of, of arts, crafts, um, and life ways. So um, this is a picture in the national, uh, the uh, anthropology collection at, at the Smithsonian with Aleutic researchers um, where they were um, explaining to us, the, the Smithsonian Museum people, how to better care for their collections. Um, uh, the young woman here is a, is, is a very um, wonderful uh, uh, regalia maker. Um, so language um, archives and language curation. Um, I have a bone to pick with the way uh, the word curate, curating is used nowadays. It's often used like when people use it to like talk about curating playlists um, and, or makeup collections <laughs> where that person is the expert, right? And, and often self-assigned expert, uh, you know, here's my playlist because um, 
I like my playlist and I'm going to share it with the world. And this is fine on this level, but that's how curators used to be thought of in museums. And in many cases, they still are, but um, they're usually seen as being the person in charge of, they're the expert over a, a specific type of collection. They're the person in charge of it. Their job is to build a collection, which often was very um, kind of taking from places, right? Um, and they're meant to interpret these collections and um, interpret them for the public in exhibitions, um, events, um, and more modern ways, videos and things like that today. But you can see that it's not quite really what's going on in language collections. And again, I, I'm a curator, but I'm in a section of the Smithsonian that I don't even have a collection. I'm supposed to curate <laughs> kind of language vitality to all of you, to the public, right? So I don't think of it this way. Um, I don't feel like I'm the expert. My job is um, to collaboratively build collections and collaboratively care for and make these uh, collections, again, discoverable and accessible to the communities that they came from, first and foremost, and researchers in general. This may include closing some collections that are not meant to be public, never were meant to be public and shouldn't be public if they're very sacred materials. Um, my job is also to work with people to represent themselves, to present and represent themselves. Not me. I will never be the expert um, of another culture other than maybe Wichita, Kansas, <laughs> middle class. I don't know. But um, I can help people to represent themselves. Um, and then also my job is to, as I said, educate the public about what it means to be live in a bilingual or multilingual, healthy, vibrant world. So at the Smithsonian, I've been given a much even larger platform than I had in Oklahoma. Um, I've gotten to do things like curate the uh, co-curate the 2016 uh, Smithsonian Folklife Festival on the National Mall about Basque culture, um, where thousands of people showed up to learn about the Basque from Europe in. Um, in Spain and France areas, um, and also the Basque Americans out west um, in Boise, in, in, uh, in California, in Reno, Nevada, who are also revitalizing their language, by the way. Um, also presenting language um, through the Mother Tongue Film Festival, which we have every year in February. And this is a really good program that allows indigenous and minoritized um, filmmakers to represent themselves. Okay. And then um, finally, um, language policy, speaking out for an inclusive language policy and language education. I can do that at a larger level. So in other words, using linguistics, using the technology that we have in linguistics now, using a platform as large as the Smithsonian to make the world more equitable for all people in all languages and hopefully have a more um, bilingual United States as well. These are some young Miami students at Miami University of Ohio. So I want to thank you very much. Um, um, I still get to work in teaching people um, and actually Shobana was here, was there in that picture with me in, um, in uh, Nankai University in China. So, and I'm going to pass it on to Shilba now. Hey. <clears throat> yes, I am muted. <laughs> Thank you, Mary. Oh, wow. What a wonderful speaker and such an informative presentation. I certainly didn't know so much about uh, languages, even though I speak um, four languages. Um, <laughs> I can read and write three languages and I can speak four languages, um, but I never knew the wonderful world of language in, in depth, like you explained. Uh, it's certainly fascinating. It almost feels like there's so much science behind even the language, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the field of linguist uh, has so much of science behind it. So I'm sure that our audience also uh, enjoyed this presentation. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, people are giving me kudos, all kudos to Mary. And thank you, thank you. 
<laughs> but I, I feel like I've over overstayed my welcome. I think it's Chauvin's time. <laughs> it is certainly, but I, I do see a couple of questions, Mary, for you. Mm -hmm. So before I bring Shobna, um, so one question was, um, are any of the endangered or silent languages fed into NLP algorithms? If you, I know you're not an AI expert, but. I'm not an expert in that. Um, Shobana may need to help me on this. I know that they are, um, uh, they've been working on that and trying it. Um, I think, you know, you need a lot of input to put them into those programs. Um, some languages like Yuchi, there wasn't really, there isn't very much written ever um, and and even recorded, but let alone written to feed into uh, natural, natural language processing programs. Um, but those that do, and I think they have, um, that have more, I think they have tried that, but I don't know the results as well, but Shobana probably does. <laughs> That's a great question. Yes. I think it's a great question because it kind of leads mm -hmm. to the whole thing of why is what Mary talked about STEM and how does it really interact with AI and and, uh, and NLP is probably the way. So as Mary, you were saying, we don't have enough data. So what a lot of documentary descriptive linguists are doing is creating that data mm -hmm. by with speakers and um, creating audio, video, transcription, translation. So where nothing exists, creating something that then computational linguists can use for various types of voice all the way to machine learning and, and translation. Mm -hmm. but very little data available. Yeah. yeah. Mary, I have one more question for you. Um, there was an attendee. He's uh, actually Jason. He's also, um, you know, one of our friends and uh, a dean of uh, the Stevens mm -hmm. College of uh, AI Institute. So he's asking, he's here with his daughter and uh, he's asking question, can you spend some time in defining what is a distinct language? And um, <laughs> that will help us understand, you know, the numbers and the <laughs> <laughs> The question none of us wants ever. Um, uh, well, um, you know, it, it's harder. In biology, it's easy. <laughs> In biology, you know, you can say uh, there's a, a morphological difference, you know, um, then it's a it's a different species, right? You know, I mean, you can kind of do that, um, but you can't really do that in language. I mean, everybody speaks differently. Everybody does. So, like, I have an idiolect. My brother has an idiolect. I mean, we might speak very close because we grew up in the same household. So there's differences all the way through. Um, and so we can't you really use that as a, we don't really have a definition. A lot of times, you know, if you just hear, um, if there's just pronunciation differences, we may consider it a different dialect and accent. But if there's more and more syntactic differences or words, you know, like when you listen to um, somebody from a different part of the United States and they may say bubbler and they may say firefly or coke, you know, you know, these kinds of things you can, you can start seeing differences, but then you get to Australia and you're like, uh, I don't really understand what they're saying. And you get somebody from Sherwood Forest and like, you have to have it like uh, subtitled, right? <laughs> you know, is it a different language? Well, we're calling it, we're calling it a dialect still, but um, other places, you know, it really depends on uh, people when people determine we are different. It's a different language now. So it becomes a, an, a, a question of identity, of politics, definitely. Um, like in China, you, we definitely, a linguist would definitely say Mandarin is different than Sichuanese, which is different than Taiwanese. But to China, they're all dialects because it shows unity, right? So there's political differences and then there's linguistic differences. It's very difficult to tell. <laughs> Yeah, I understand that's a, a really hard question, but I guess it stemmed from the notion that you said something like 40% of the languages are endangered. Mm -hmm. and I, I, just, I kind of wonder if there's just like some may be endangered, but we may also be seeing a, a new birth of other languages and maybe that has changed over time because of media and, and other aspects of modern. We do. You know, there, for a while they really thought that um, that 
dialects would taper off with national newscasts and things like that, but it hasn't. Dialects seem to be as strong as they were before and other dialects are coming up, that's for sure. That's always a question of identity. People feel very um, uh, strongly attached to their local dialects, right? Um, and there are new languages being born, <laughs> but not nearly at a fast rate as the endangered and languages disappearing. Not nearly at the same rate. Um, languages do take time. Um, what we're seeing now with, um, with renewed languages from languages that were silent, um, some linguists might say that those are um, those are a Creole or they're they're not the same as the original language. Um, to the people who are renewing these languages and speaking them, that doesn't matter. The connections are there, enough of the vocabulary, enough of the grammar. Um, I wouldn't say those are new languages, but they're certainly they certainly are different than the language that was spoken 200 years ago, right? So you know these are. These are big questions, um, but they're also, you know, I, I think we do need to be very aware that um, we're losing more languages than we're gaining. And, the, and we've never seen this before in the history. From what we can tell historically from written um, records, that there have, that we've pretty much maintained this number of languages um, throughout history. So this is the first major really awful experiment to see you know in what might happen if the world has considerably fewer languages to work with so yeah so i don't know if you know this uh, but india has over 1600 languages um, mm -hmm. and um, some are dialects like you were mentioning but some like there are many more dialects and but they they claim to have 1600 languages so mm -hmm. um are these some of these are documented or how do you differentiate some of them are some of them are and again um uh, uh shobana has much more experience working in india than i do um you know yeah and i mean india is usually touted um, in other areas of the world of having a very progressive language policy, especially for education. Granted, there are very many issues with it and um, places where it doesn't work out the way it probably was intended or should or is on the books, but it's still um, looked at as being enlightened in that um, there is room for language diversity. So, but yeah, there's a lot that aren't described, I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure. <laughs> Yeah, I'm that's sure one of the things Shibata does. <laughs> yeah, and I want to bring her on board. I know this is so fascinating. Uh, we could go on and on this discussion, um, but I want to also bring Shobna here and we would love to hear from her. So welcome Shobna. Um, Shobna Lakshmi Chalaya is Distinguished Research Professor of Linguistics and Associate Dean of Research and Advancement at the College of Information, University of North Texas. Her research has four areas of focus on the documentation of the Tibeto-Burman languages of Northeast India. She was a program director for the US National Science Foundation's Documenting Endangered Languages program from 2012 to 2015, where she now serves as an NSF intermittent expert. She has received major funding from the National Science Foundation and fellowships from the American Institute of Indian Studies, National Endowment for the Humanities, and American Council of Learned Societies. She is a recipient of the Nehru Fulbright Chair Fellowship for 2020-2021. She is the founding director of the Computational Resource for South Asian Language Archive at the UNT Digital Library. And there are a lot of her publications, include, including a grammar of Matei, the handbook of descriptive linguistic fieldwork. Um, and she has written many, many additional articles on Tibeto-Burman language. So without further ado, welcome Shobna. Thanks so much. And thanks for organizing this. It's really great. Uh, I'm Mary, thank you for, for visiting and talking about your story. And I think, um, one of the people who put in the chat, uh, maybe it was Maurice, Dr. Wheeler said, you know, it was nice how you 
you're a great storyteller is what he said. And that, that, that's really true. So we, we learned so much by the way you presented everything. I'm not going to add a lot to, um, you know, documentary and descriptive linguistics uh, per se, because you've really told the story so well. But I did want to tell a little bit about the programs that we have at UNT and perhaps in that way, tell you also a little bit more about what we do in linguistics, as well as our other um, STEM related programs at our college, at the College of Information. And Adam, you've got uh, some slides that you can share. I don't have them fancily set out, Mary, like you. I really like the what you use there, the crazy slides. We have our little PowerPoint. Here it is. Okay, so um, let me just. Thank you. Okay, so the first thing I want to tell you is that we have three different departments in our college: um, linguistics learning technologies and um, uh, information science. And uh, there's, there's a fair bit of overlap and there's also a fair bit of, of uh, you may, a bit of similarity in that you may not know what these three different departments are all about. So let me tell you a little bit about linguistics. Um, is there a slide right before this one? There we go. Yeah, with all the little pictures on it. So um, linguistics, really uh, deals with the kind of scientific study of language. And so we know that languages are not put, it, put together randomly, but there are predictive rules um, that speakers use unconsciously perhaps to generate, uh, to generate the kind of communication that they, that they use, uh, where they use the language. What's happening? We got like a disco effect going on. <laughs> So it's okay. We can get rid of the slides. That's fine. I, I can just I can just talk without them. That's all, that's fine. Um, so when you think about yeah, let's leave it like this. This seems pretty good. Yeah, let's do, let's do it this way. So when you think about language and all of these different parts, you can say that you know we have sounds. Those sounds are combined to make words. They are to sentences. Then you get larger pieces like discourses where we're having conversations or telling stories, and in order to study each of those different levels, uh, all the way from sounds to discourse, what we've learned in the past, say 10, 15 years, is that technology uh, can really speed up and make deeper the ways that we understand those different levels of language structure. So if you're interested in the way people speak and the different sounds of language, you might be able to use different acoustic um, analytic techniques. So you're just you know, taking sound files and measuring the ways that wave, the um, sound waves are modulated by the way the articulators work and so on. So people who are really into like phonetics are uh, able to work with sound files and uh, just look at the details of why is it that you heard the sound k and I heard the sound g? What was there around surrounding that sound k that made it sound difficult to you? Or if you're on a phone, why is it so hard to hear the difference? Did you say Fish or wish? I'm not quite sure. Why is that? Why is the f and the w different? So they look at the, they study the kind of qualities of sound. And for the endangered languages that Mary was talking about, sometimes we learn some really exotic, different sounds that are very different to us and very exciting to learn and look at the acoustic patterns. So in addition to looking at sounds, we can also look at the, word, the ways that words are, are composed of. And so we talked about NLP a little bit before, and there are a whole host of kind of intermediate technologies that help us break sentences and words up into analyzable parts and then reorganize them so we can understand what are the possibilities of how people put words together and what are the impossible ways in which they put words or clauses together. So these technologies are easily learned these days and they are very much a part of our education in linguistics. So if you want to get a degree in linguistics, you might do something like machine learning, natural language processing, with a little bit of math, with a little bit of Python coding, and doing big data analysis of language work, and go and work for Google, Facebook, Amazon, places like that. But if you're interested in doing something that where the language is not really discovered yet, and you're creating the purpose, you can still be doing techno technology enhanced work. It's just that you're doing it before the data, data is even created. You're helping actually create the corpus that can then be used for NLP. 
So we would love to talk to you more about that. Um, I put some, some pictures up here for you to look at uh, to, to help you remember. So we have here the, the um, what, is, what is this called? Um, ventriloquist, right? Who's, who's got his face over the, the mannequin that starts speaking. So if you think about machines that talk, how does that happen? It's because linguists have really unpacked things about sound and also about words and clauses and been able to kind of do prediction on what things happen. So you're typing along in Google and all of a sudden the, the, the program, whichever one it is, then predicts what you were about to say. How did it know? Did it read your mind? No, there was a linguist that created a large corpus and helped train a machine to predict what might come next. And so this is what I wanted. I thought this little ventriloquist picture might help you remember that. Then on the right-hand side, we have a picture of uh, David Harrison in this video called Linguists, which you can probably Google now and see. And here you see something very similar to what Mary was talking about. But David does not belong to these communities and nor are they here in North America. They're all over the world where he and many other linguists work to try to help people create resources for their languages so that they can then learn them and, and use them for passing down to for future generations. How do you actually write that down? Do you write it down on a pen and paper the way that David has done? Or do you use a fancy video recorder and then use more technologies to process that? There are all those different ways that linguists can document the languages, languages out there. Then right above that, I've got a little map of different uh, dialect, ver ver various ways that people talk around the United States. And that sort of reminds you of the fact that linguists look at language variation and look at the ways in which people say, I belong to a particular community because I speak like you, or I don't belong to your community because I say things slightly different from what you do. So they've got the Texan one there that's, that's well known to us here in, in, in uh, Denton, Texas, near Dallas. How do y'all? Um, and probably most of you who live in the Northeast or on the West Coast don't say that. Okay, so we can go on now. So we have degrees here in computational linguistics, but also in do um, documentary linguistics. Uh, we also have something that Mary talked about previously, which was her first introduction to linguistics, which was teaching English and they're learning about English structure, right? So we've got uh, several different, both un undergraduate and graduate degrees or concentrations in teaching English um, and learning about language through that, through that um, path. Okay, so let me tell you briefly about the other departments. Um, is it possible to go to slide number four? Let's go to slide number four. We have a department called Learning Technologies. And in Learning Technologies, our students learn about all the new uh, techniques, tools, methods that are used to teach um, using technology, new ways of teaching altered reality, virtual reality, game design. How do you use those technologies in um, putting them into some kind of interactional instructional system? Are they effective? Um, how far are they effective? How do they need to be? Um, how do they need to be integrated with more traditional ways of learning? And they really look at, you know, some really complex kinds of things that we try to teach students like critical thinking or problem solving. So how does technology help with those uh, different STEM, field, uh, STEM fields of education? But if you study in this area, you can, you know, it, it seems like it's a very easy way to get a, a, an exciting, interesting career because you can choose the topic, like supposing you're into math or physics or, or linguistics, and then you learn how to teach it through these new technologies. So you can kind of marry those two things. So instructional design, instructional technologies, software developing, game developing, web design, all of these things could also be, be used, uh, learned through learning technologies. There is actually a brand new Bachelor of Applied Sciences in Learning Technologies available right now. Um, so we uh, welcome your questions about that. And it's, you know, designed to meet this increasing workforce demand to support schools, businesses, industries, but specifically STEM areas and using technologies for that. All right, let's go on to information science. 
I think the next slide is all the different jobs that you can get. And we can look at that for a second. All right. And then we have our third department, information science. Now, information science is really a very large umbrella uh, uh, field which looks at how data is collected, how it's information, how that information is stored, how it's organized, how is it discovered? You know, how does how do I allow, for example, if I have a teenager in my home and they want to learn about um, music that was uh, you know popular in the 1930s in the US, how do they go about doing that? Where should they go look for it? Where is it going to be organized? What are what is the metadata? What are the hooks that they can use to go out and or the keywords that they can use to go out and find that information? And then another thing we look at is how is it preserved and how is that information connected to other bits of information out there in our uh, in our internet universe, in our digital universe that we're in. You might think that you know information science is very divorced from linguistics, but actually, as Mary was talking about the fact that we now have language archives where we have digital information. This is a very close overlap in our college between those who are in library information science, not everybody, but there's, there are a few people now who are working in the area of language archiving and looking at how language data is collected, how language data is stored and organized, discovered, preserved and connected. And that's where we have um, our kind of in-house language archive portal. It's about South Asian languages, but we're learning so much about, um, for example, how is language discovered? How is that information discovered? We have linguists who've collected information about languages in Northeast India. It's in the archive. And now we've got speakers of those And I don't know, you can go okay. maybe look at my computer and see what's going on. Did I get that comment? Okay. Um, hi, everyone. So Shobana just had a, a video glitch here just for a moment, but uh, we're going to have her jump onto my screen so she can continue where she left off. So stand by. Okay. All right. Luckily, we're in the same office. So. Um, all right. Well, that's what I wanted to tell you about the information science. Um, I don't think so. Okay. I'm good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so I, I don't want to keep you for too long, but I did want to tell you that one of the big, very popular programs we have right now in information science is the data science program. And um, in, in data science, uh, we, we find that we have students interested in, in a wide range of things going all the way from uh, looking at, uh, you know, how banking occurs, uh, how, what happens with health information. Um, and uh, it really could be any kind of business application of big data. But within all of that, we also have a lot of stuff on, on language. So a lot of the students in data science are taking courses in natural language processing. So they can also be playing with big language data, not just big numbers data or other kind of um, other kind of data like health informatics. So data science is another very, very popular, I, I would think the most popular right now, uh, program in our college, but people are learning slowly about the um, the linguistics programs as well, especially through documentary linguistics and the overlap with library information science and computational work. Um, so I will stop there, uh, Shilpi, because I think that was my my goal was to tell our our audience about different careers in these in these STEM careers. Is that that's that's was my charge, and I believe that's that's. Uh, I've covered most of the topics here. Thank you for that opportunity. Yes, thank you, Shobna. Um, and uh, for our viewers and attendees today, Shobna, if you can share some of the things that you would like, uh, you know, 
that would help people to follow up and understand the various career paths and the degrees that UNT provides. Uh, please share them and we can put them in show notes along with the video um, and also create a post for it. So uh, it's helpful. Yeah, absolutely. We can do that. We can actually share our brochures and then you can put them along with these. Yeah. That'll be great. Um, Adam, can we stop sharing the screen, please? Adam, we're going to stop sharing and I'm just going to stop here and then I'll go on to my computer. I think it's, it's back up, right? Yeah, I guess we're ready to go. Okay, cool. Thank you, Shobna. This was wonderful. Thanks so much. Thank you. I'm going to join over there. Yep. All right. Um, so, so with that, let me quickly, I know we are a little over time and thank you everyone for staying and we won't keep you long. So like I said, we'll have some more information. We'll have also have the recording available of this event, uh, as well as the links to uh, the slide deck that Shobna and Adam have shared with us about programs on UNT. And Mary, if you would like to share information about Smithsonian, your work, uh, please share that. I'm happy to uh, put that also, just so that you know people have the whole uh, package of today's uh, event. Uh, I, it, it has been nothing but spectacular hearing from both of you and uh, everything that the field of linguistics as well as the University of North Texas has to offer and how it connects a direct path, uh, non-linear, but still a direct path to everything that students are thinking or dreaming of today and working with all the big tech firms also, as well as creating new paths like, like the uh, collection of data, right? So that's very interesting. Um, and, and just to, to recap a little bit, uh, we offer the Presidential Volunteer Service Award. And if you want to be connected to any of the events in the future that we host, uh, please stay connected, join us in our community. Um, here's the website, um, it's www.dataethicsforall. Um, and I'm, I'm putting this also in the notes, but if you want to take a minute to quickly jump on right now and join the community, we would really love that. I'm going to give everyone a second to join our fabulous community. It's a great way to network and meet with people across generations from C-level execs to students uh, of middle and high school. And I also want to take a minute to thank our fabulous leadership team, my fabulous youth leadership team, and my big um, group of very talented, very energetic volunteers. We are a 100% volunteer run organization. And my leadership team uh, and my youth leadership team, I can't thank them enough um, for how far we have come. We have miles to go, but we have come far. And uh, we can't pull any of these events without you. So thank you all for your support. Thanks to everyone for attending today. Hope you found this event useful and informative. And we'll see you again soon. Take care. Thank you all. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, Mary. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Take care.